And I think we're just going to have um, you know, a more walkable presence about our communities. That is important for, as we've talked about, the millennial generation that I'm a part of. I don't know if you count as a millennial. Uh, but the millennial generation, <laughs> it's ding, important. It ding, is. Now. I had to get that in there. Uh, but it's also incredibly important to baby boomers who want to retire in the community in which they reside and they've become empty nesters. And so we have to figure out a way to diversify our housing stock. Hello, and welcome to the newest edition of Meeting with the Manager. I'm City Manager Eric Tungate. Today, I have the honor of welcoming in our state representative, Robert Wittenberg, and I also have the pleasure of introducing our new senator, Jeremy Moss, who has just recently taken office. Welcome to both of you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thank you for being here. So, Senator, I want to start with you. So, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself for those of us who may not know you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's really, it's an exciting uh, endeavor to be able to represent Oak Park uh, in the Michigan State Senate. I had my roots here in local government, so I'm very used to being inside of a city hall. I served on the Southfield City Council, uh, where I was elected in 2011. Uh, as the youngest ever member of the Southfield City Council and then in 2014 ran for a spot in the State House right alongside Robert actually. We were both candidates uh, for the State House in 2014 and we were elected to serve together. So for two terms Robert and I served together in the Michigan House of Representatives and due to term limits our, our state senator uh, was unable to run for re-election. So 11 communities in Oakland County are in the 11th Senate District uh, including my hometown Southfield, including right here in Oak Park and other communities. And I'm, I ran and was very excited to get the support uh, for this community to serve in the Michigan State Senate. It's really an honor. Well, welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. State Representative <laughs> Wittenberg, you're, you're an old hat around here. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yeah no, I'm, I'm, I was actually elected for my third and final terms. You know, we have some of the most restrictive term limits in the country. Uh, you can only serve three two-year terms in the State House. So I was reelected for my third and final term. Uh, and get to continue uh, serving the residents of the 27th district. So in addition to Oak Park, it's Berkeley, Huntington Woods, Ferndale, Pleasant Ridge, Hazel Park, Royal Oak Township all make up the 27th house district. So um, I look forward to, to you know my last term and, and trying to get some good things accomplished for uh, Oak Park and the surrounding communities. Well, we're very excited about the new term coming up with you. Thank you. So Senator Moss, let's come back to you for a moment. I, I'm curious what you enjoy most about your time serving in the legislature. No question about it, it's the people. It's the people that you meet while campaigning door to door, uh, but it's also the people that you meet when you're in office. Uh, we're kind of this uh, ombudsman, for lack of a better term. When people don't know where to turn, when they're struggling with their electricity bill, when they're dealing with a foreclosure issue, when something is uh, you know, in such dire straits in their life, and they don't know where else to go, we get a lot of those phone calls in the legislature. So it's, it's personally rewarding to be able to help them navigate through the bureaucracy of state government to solve the problems that they go through in their everyday lives. We vote on bills, we sit, we sit in committee hearings, we introduce legislation. That's a great piece of the job, but the best piece of the job is helping out uh, our neighbors in state government. And it it's, it's all goes back to this nuance of government. I think, generally speaking, a lot of people don't truly understand some of it or pay attention to some of it, unfortunately. And you were very effective um, serving kind of in the role that Senator Moss was talking about as an ombudsman, mm -hmm. um, getting some communities together. And this was over our district court situation, among some other things that, uh, you know, that just that relationship aspect of that and getting people together and on the same page. And, and uh, I wanted to thank you for that because it was a tremendous effort. You know, I, I think that's so important with, with what I do and what we do as legislators is, is that it's a, it's a people business, right? It's, it's, you have to be able to work together, uh, bring people into the room, uh, find common ground, same kind of thing. You know, we're both Democrats, but we work with Republicans in the legislature as well. And right. so 
Um, in order to get things done, you have to be able to reach across the aisle. So you work with all different kinds of personalities, people from all different backgrounds. Uh, and so for me, again, you want to come in and, and it's not, you don't want to be combative and you don't want to say this person's the enemy. It's saying, where do we find the common ground? You know, what are the things that we agree on so that we can move forward together? Because if, if there's a stalemate and nothing gets done, then that doesn't help anyone. And so, right. um, you know, here in the, in, and then especially here in the community, obviously I mentioned the seven uh, different communities that are comprised here in the 27th district. Wonderful communities, but they're not all the same, and they don't right. all have the same needs as, as we, you know, as yeah. we talked about. And so being able to bring all the different stakeholders to the table uh, to actually get some things accomplished, uh, I'm, I'm always happy to do that. So I, I appreciate you saying that and appreciate the work that, that you've done and that well, you're doing. You. And so I think it, you know, again, it helps the entire community when we can, we can get some things accomplished like that. You know, we've really become this mini region within a region, a much larger yeah. region. And it's great to see us on the same page finally on some of these things. You know, one of the things that you kind of touched on, um, Representative, and I wanted to open this up to both of you, one of the things that people think all the time is that none of you are ever agreeing on anything and mostly along partisan lines. But that's not really the reality of it. Most of the time you're actually agreeing. And it's those few times that, of course, get into the newspaper. And, and, I, and I think that's exactly right. And I'm sure Jeremy can tell some more specifics on this. Uh, but I would say, you know, 90, probably even 95 percent of what we deal with in Lansing and what we vote on in Lansing is, has, has overwhelming bipartisan support, right? Yeah. You'll see uh, votes of 100 and, 109 to, to 1, right, or 100 to, to 10, whatever it might be. Um, but it's, but th those, those issues don't get the press coverage, right? People don't hear about them. It's those wedge issues. It's those really, you know, controversial mm -hmm. issues that people start to hear about. And that's what's in the paper. And, yeah. and unfortunately, those are obviously some really important issues. And so those are the issues that we're fighting on. Sure. Uh, but there is a lot of, there are a lot of different issues that we are working on that, that's bipartisan. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, the attention grabbing, headline grabbing uh, fights do happen. And we do get frustrated as Democrats. Uh, in the legislature dealing with some of the things that we think are morally or ethically or constitutionally wrong. And we fight and we speak out against those. But it's a small fraction of the work that we actually do. During the lame duck session, we took up several election bills. Uh, and we fought hard against a proposal that we thought was going to strip uh, some uh, authority of a petition gatherers from being allowed to actually put a ballot proposal on the ballot. But at the, in the same night, three of my bills actually uh, dealing with the same topic passed with near unanimous support, and it was kind of a, an afterthought in the newspaper article. Mm -hmm. It was, here was the big fight, and oh, also three of these bills also passed uh, in the same topic. Um, so uh, we try and talk about as much uh, on the issues as we do, uh, that we do get along on, as much as we talk about the issues where there is a contrast between the parties. Um, but sometimes it's just not as exciting. <laughs> That's uh, very true. So let's, let's talk about some of the issues we don't always agree on. Um, and in terms of, you know, transit in the metro area, I, I, I think I generally understand where both of you stand in your support for transit, but where do you see this conversation going um, in metropolitan Detroit? And will it take, you know, we have a new governor, will it take aid of the new governor and, and, and maybe some more acts of the legislature in order to get something done? in this area? Mass transit is a necessity. And we are working uh, with <coughs> colleagues who believe that mass transit is a luxury. Uh, it's not just exciting to be able to hop on a train or a tram and go down to the ballpark. It's a necessity for people who need to go to work uh, and don't have means to reliable uh, alternative transportation. And so when we had this ballot initiative in 2016 to support a mass transit proposal, we were outspoken in support of it to better connect our region and connect people to where they need to go to earn their paycheck. But we, especially uh, in the communities that we represent and right here in Oak Park, know how vital, reliable transportation is for people in their everyday lives. So it's going to be something that we're going to continue to fight for and we're going to work with our, our new governor, Gretchen Whitmer, to make mass transit a reality here in Metro Detroit. And, and to, to kind of piggyback on what he was saying, uh, when you talk about jobs, right, and that opens up when you have reliable transit, it opens up the, the area that you can actually look for jobs, right? So if you don't have uh, transportation or good transportation options, you're only going to look in your, in your general area, right, just right around you. But this opens things up. Additionally, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big infrastructure, it's an investment in infrastructure, and that creates jobs as well. 
And so to me, yeah. this will give access to more jobs for people and it also creates jobs as we're building this. We have crumbling infrastructure in yeah. the state, both uh, our roads and bridges and our, our, our underground infrastructure. Uh, and we, we have to make those investments because if we don't, uh, it's going to come back and bite us because it's going to be even more costly the longer we wait to do these kind of things. And you touched on something I think is very critical. The world of economic development has changed right in front of us. Um, oftentimes I think it gets attributed to millennials, but the reality is that there's a higher recognition of these things in millennials than there is other age brackets. But the reality of it is, is that economic development companies are going to cities and places, and not always cities, but places where they believe that they can find the best and brightest and have the best quality of life. And yes, that's going to require us to have top grade infrastructure and transit and you know you bike paths and, and whatever it may be. But I think we are lagging in our, our legislative ability to, to shadow that idea. Do you see anything changing with that in terms of new legislation that might empower that idea? One of the groups that I'm very strongly affiliated with as a former council member myself is the Michigan Municipal League, which I know has a big influence on advocating for local communities to define themselves and then to promote and advertise themselves around the country and around the world. Uh, you know, studies really do show that, uh, especially in the millennial generation, uh, they'll look for a place to live first, yes. and they'll look for the job opportunities second. So if we really want to pitch Metro Detroit, if we really want to pitch Southern Oakland County, if we really want to pitch Oak Park, we need to make sure that Oak Park has the local tools in their toolbox um, to create the kind of community that people want to live in. I think you're doing a great job now. I think the economic development that has been going on over the last several years in Oak Park has really enhanced the quality of life here. But we have a legislature uh, that's run by a Republican majority that really believes in this one-size-fits-all model uh, and has stripped your ability to enact some of these ordinances uh, that would be Oak Park specific because Oak Park has its own character and mm -hmm. Oak Park has its own issues that it's dealing with. Uh, and that's what we find so troubling um, dealing with our friends on the other side of the aisle. Um, Robert and I believe in local control. Robert and I believe in placemaking. Mm -hmm. Robert and I believe in a local community's ability to figure out what makes its character stand out. And we've just been confronting a conservative legislature that says, you know, our economic model has to be statewide, and so what works in Alpena, sure, that should work in Elk Park, too. And we say, not so fast. Yeah. You know, for, for me, um, I always tell people, like, you can't cut your way to greatness, right? You have to make those investments. It's one and of so, my favorite lines, by yeah, the way. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's right. So you really have to, you know, have to spend to do that. And so, uh, actually, one of the ways I was talking, you know, I've, I've been talking about and I've been trying to push this is, is implementing a graduated income tax. And that would actually cut taxes on 94% of taxpayers here in the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. but would generate $1.18 billion of new revenue every single year. And so if people just pay their fair share, uh, that would be a lot of money that we can put towards uh, our roads and our schools. And, and so that's something, you know, additionally talking about our schools, when we talk about our communities, you have to have great schools too, right? When you talk about families looking to move to, to uh, particular areas, schools, right? If they, they have to have good schools there. And then also when you start talking as well about jobs, these companies want to go somewhere where the talent, when they talk about talent, it's people, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's candidates that have uh, the educational background, that are, that are smart, hardworking candidates. And so uh, I think that's something we need to look at as well. You know, unfortunately, over the last you know, eight years, um, we've seen a, a, a disinvestment in education and infrastructure and you know, all these different things. And I think that has to change. We and really have to invest in our schools and our local communities. And a, a disinvestment in revenue sharing. That's the tax yeah. dollars that you yeah. and I pay to Lansing. And there's an expectation that it's going to come back to the local community to invest in the local community. And unfortunately, we're dealing with legislators that when the first cuts come out of the budget, they've been cutting revenue sharing first. And so when we talk about communities under duress, communities under financial uh, hardships, a lot of these are state accelerated crises. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we really need to focus on investing in the local level and allow the local governing officials to figure out with that investment, what are the best places um, to grow the local economy. So, Senator Moss, I wanted to pivot now to this issue of the high costs of car insurance. This is a, an issue that, you know, for my residents here in Oak Park, I hear almost every week someone is complaining about. Um, we've had 
many, many conversations from, you know, changing our zip code to, you know, why is this issue really is as much of an issue as it is? And if you could explain it to us and then also give us, you know, your position on it. I know, you know, um, Mayor Duggan of Detroit was, was really getting behind a bill last year and do you see something coming this year? And then what is your position? We canvassed through almost every community in this district. Uh, and then when he started to canvass in Oak Park, heard a lot more about car insurance. Southfield, a lot more about car insurance. Royal Oak Township, a lot more about oh, car Ferndale insurance. Ferndale too. Ferndale as well. Um, didn't hear it as much in other communities. And the reason is, is that there are certain communities that are redlined. Uh, I live in Southfield eight blocks, uh, actually less than eight blocks away from Eight Mile Road. And so I feel it uh, as, as a resident because as you get closer to the actual city of Detroit, uh, we're paying higher insurance rates. And so we've kind of been embracing a plan to tackle the discriminatory practices that keep auto insurance high. I, we, we've been pushing kind of a three-part plan um, in the short term. Uh, make sure that there are no non, there, there are no, the non-driving factors uh, that keep our insurance rates high, like your credit score, your education level, your marital status, uh, those are thrown out. If they have nothing to do with your driving ability and how safe you are on the road, then they shouldn't be weighted so high in your insurance rate. So that's the short-term plan. The medium-term plan, which I support, is I think we need to have an elected insurance commissioner. Right now we have an insurance, a state insurance department that basically reports only to the governor. Uh, and takes direction from the governor and somewhat from the state legislature. I think we need an independently elected insurance commissioner to tackle some of the issues uh, in our insurance industry, and that's the medium-term plan. And the long-term plan is what we talked about. I think we need a comprehensive mass transit system to make sure there are safe alternatives for uninsured drivers uh, to get where they need to go. The uninsured drivers are what's driving up the cost. So if we could get them off the road, um, it, would, it would lower the cost for the rest of us and it would give them a safe alternative uh, than to be driving without insurance. I mean, obviously this is a really complex issue and, and, and this is one where uh, it's not a necessarily partisan issue. So we, we, have, we have the best benefits in the, in the country and I think that's something to hang our hat on. Uh, and so for me, again, we don't want to just cut benefits uh, and then because then you're getting less and paying less. For me, let's try to keep those benefits and let's work together to see what we can do to lower the rates and still keep those benefits. And so there, there are things that we are working on. There's things that both sides agree on, but we haven't really tried to push those, uh, those, those initiatives. We haven't tried to push those uh, things that would try to lower the rates, right? There's, there's one side that just wants to overhaul the whole system. And what we said, there are things where you can implement a fee schedule. I'm sure people, you know, the residents of home have, at home have seen the, the billboards that says, you know, we pay uh, $5,000 here, and in other states they pay 500 for some kind of medical procedure. So let's have a fee schedule. We've talked about that. That'll lower rates. Right, right. Uh, having a fraud authority, right? Any kind of fraud in the system that's costing up and dri driving up the cost, uh, we need to look at that. So there are a lot of different things that we agree on, but unfortunately, um, you know, there's, there's one, they're, 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 the leadership in Lansing has been pushing just to do away with the whole system, whereas we say, no, we agree on some of these issues. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's try to lower the rates before we just throw the whole system out. Yeah. Uh, but there's the, the MCCA, which, you know, with the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Association, and that's the group that, you know, when you talk about the unlimited benefits, right, the, um, that the, someone, if they are in an accident and, and they need the benefits above I think it's, uh, I forget the number exactly, it's about $550,000, right? So the first $550,000, your auto insurance pays for, and then there's this fund that pays for uh, up and uh, above and beyond that number. And so the group that runs that, there's no transparency with how they uh, set their rates. So, so let me stop you because that, <laughs> that's, I was going to go there next, and I'm glad you br brought this up. We think there is literally built, correct me if I'm wrong, but literally $20 billion. It's over $20, 20 billion. No dollars. And, over and, 20 billion. And, there, and no one has to disclose anything no, about it. So when, when they say, oh, we're broke, which is why we're raising this line item in your insurance bill. We're broke. We need more money because we need to do you know, more payouts for, for accident victims. I don't know that. You yeah. don't know that. Right. So we have actually proposed legislation to subject the Catastrophic Claims Association to the principles of the Freedom of Information Act. Yep. And so that we can actually vet what's in there because right now they're raising our rates and we have no accountability for yep. their data or their measurement uh, for increasing those rates. They say they show their rates or they, they show their numbers, right? They show how much they have 
and they show you how much they charge but they don't show the actuarial data, right? So to say, this is how many people have been injured, this is how many people we think might be injured, uh, to actually show the numbers of how it breaks down, right? They have act actuaries who are, who are running these numbers, but they won't, they won't release that information. And that's what we need to know if we really want to delve in and say, uh, you know, that they're charging us too much or not enough. Right. So right. we need to do that. I think your, your point is a very good one, and that is, you know, this isn't just a one trick pony. I mean, there's many different features to yep. to this kind of reform. And it's going to it's a conversation that's going to continue to come up and I'm glad that both of you are are very involved in it. I want to pivot now though. Okay? Okay. And I want to go into more, you know, Oak Park specific, more regional questions for all of you. If I asked both I'm going to ask both of you the same question, but if I Senator Moss if I started with you and asked you in 25 years What's different about Metro Detroit? That's a really good question. Uh, I think we're going to have more walkable communities. Uh, and I think that um, we're going to just probably uh, ditch this auto dependence and have more walkable corridors, storefronts. Uh, and we're beginning to see a lot of cities kind of rethink um, you know, where they want to go. Uh, I think this nine mile corridor is going to be just totally changed in 25 years. Starting from what Ferndale has done over the last maybe 15 years, I think it's going to come right up into Oak Park and into South. Well, you know, we have our project starting uh, this spring. Exactly so. right. And I hope that that goes even beyond the borders of Oak Park into Southfield. I'm trying to agitate some Southfield folks to get it done, too. And I think we're just going to have, um, you know, a more walkable presence about our communities. That is important for, as we've talked about, the millennial generation that I'm a part of. I don't know if you count as a millennial. Uh, but the millennial generation, <laughs> it's important. Ding, it is. Down. I had to get that in there. Uh, but it's also incredibly important to baby boomers who want to retire in the community in which they reside and they've become empty nesters. And so we have to figure out a way to diversify our housing stock, uh, especially in Southern Oakland County, especially in Oak Park, uh, where you have these single family lots all throughout the community that are going to need to be rethought. I think that yeah. the neighborhoods are strong and will remain strong, but as baby boomers want to downsize, as an emerging generation wants to figure out where do they want their first home to be, do they want it to look like uh, uh, that uh, neighborhood home or do they want something different? We're going to rethink our housing stock uh, and to create more walkable communities around uh, a different type of living space. All while I think these neighborhoods are going to remain intact, going to remain vibrant, going to have kids playing in the yards. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think it's just going to be a more serene, walkable uh, Southern Oakland County in 25 years. Let's, let's move on from that to this discussion about health care. And this is another one of these <laughs> mammoth discussion pieces. But, but you know, we, we see it. I was talking to the two of you um, before the show, and, and we see it here at the city of Oak Park um, in tons of ways where because we have no say in how the national health care system is orchestrated, um, there's not much we can do to control our future and our own destiny. And so what are your thoughts? Do you, what do you see changing? And if I then maybe answer if in 25 years, what's, is it different? Of course, I, I think healthcare should be a, a right and not a privilege, and at least some basic level of healthcare. And so you're starting to see this conversation during campaigns uh, that people are saying, you know, because healthcare should be a right, that there's universal healthcare or there's Medicare for all. These are some of the discussions that we have to have because the costs are, are, are getting out of control. Uh, and you look at pharmaceutical, right, you, you know, cost of prescription drugs, uh, and these drug companies that are charging an arm and a leg, literally, you know, for, for, for people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it, it, it's something that we have to uh, deal with. And, and, and you know, obviously, it's more at a federal level, but there's certain things that at, at a state level you can do as well uh, in requiring transparency for uh, pharmaceutical companies um, and some of the investment we're making in our local communities here. Uh, I think this is one of the biggest problems of our generation it, it is, is going yeah. de is, is dealing with the cost of health care. And that's the, the issue because people always say, well, how are we going to you know, lower the rates? So it's like, well, why are our rates so high? Why is health care so mm -hmm. expensive? What can we do to try to lower uh, the health care costs? And I think what we need to do is, you know, w with insurance, right, your risk pool, they talk about risk pools. The bigger your pool right, the lower your risk, you know, things go down because you have more people in there. And so if you have 
everyone in the country in, in one pool, right. um, that's one way that we well, can look to well, control me, our costs. And, and on that point, one of the things that um, you mentioned was insurance risk pools. And yeah. here in the city of Oak Park, we're part of the MML risk pool. Yeah. And so we purchase insurance premiums at a lower discounted rate than we otherwise would on our own, hypothetically. We don't do that with health care. In Ohio, cities and county governments partner in consortiums and go out and have more buying power to negotiate health care prices. Now, there is some of an effort going on here in the state of Michigan, but I'm curious what the two of you think in terms of giving that a, the push it needs to get over the edge so we can start seeing this and lowering costs because, as you say, you know, the, the normal rate of market inflation is 2 to 3 percent, and in health care it exceeds, you know, it's 9, 10, 12 percent in some cases. Uh, it's not sustainable. It's not market at all. Right. So, what do you? What are your thoughts about pushing this, this uh, pooling consortium idea over the edge? I, I think that's. Uh, I think you're starting that conversation with us now, and that's something that we'd be happy to to chat about. Uh, you know, like, like I said, we we need to control the cost because it's going to get it's going to get out of hand. It already has, right? I mean, yeah. there's people. You know, there's families that are going bankrupt in our communities, our local governments. Um, are not going to be sustainable uh, with these costs. And one of the biggest costs I'm sure you see are legacy costs. Yeah. Your retirees and continuing to pay for the benefits that they've negotiated and earned. And some of these costs uh, are, are unfunded and it's kind of a pay-as-you-go system from the city coffers. And the majority to, though, exactly, especially with OPEB liability. Exactly right, exactly right. And it's interesting because as we go back to an earlier conversation, uh, a lot of that matches right up. There are uh, you know, several uh, billion dollars in unfunded liabilities that communities are facing. Mm -hmm. And there's several billion dollars of stripped revenue sharing that we've been experiencing. Right, right. I think those go on the same track. We are, we are bleeding our cities dry of, taking, of managing some of these health care costs. Uh, and so we wonder why are communities under financial distress and why are emergency managers uh, mm -hmm. coming into these communities to, to clean things up? Because the state has underfunded your ability to manage some of these expenses. Right. No, that's an excellent point. And, and you, you know, we could get out, and we are here in the city of Oak Park, we're out in front of our pension liabilities, long-term liabilities, but there is no hope as dire as that may sound, there is currently no hope based on all the things we have in front of us for us getting out in front of our retiree health care liabilities. There's nothing we can do, and that's throwing good money after bad to try to pre-fund some of those long-term liabilities. We certainly have to pay our obligations on a pay-as-you-go basis, and we do, but to get out in front of this long-term future liability would be throwing good money after bad, and we're not willing to do that unless we have some assistance. If we want to grow uh, good communities, financially solvent communities, we are going to have to continue to uh, boost revenue sharing from the state. We're, uh, the state can only function if our communities are strong, and we need to take that investment on the state level and bring it back to the local level. Sure. We're the worst in the country when it comes to that. I mean, on I a lot of talked about that. I'm sure you've yeah. shown that chart and, and graph yeah. to people. Uh, you yeah. know, other states, there's some states who have given you know this much and this you know, and as it goes up, we're the only one that it's <laughs> gone the down. That it's yeah, negative yeah. over the years yeah, of the amazing. amount of money that this the state. In has almost given every category, the yeah, state. Yeah. We need to catch up with the 49 other states yeah. whose, whose communities have seen revenue growth. We're the only ones that are trending in, in yeah. revenue shortfalls. Right. Yeah. Well, this has been just a great conversation, and I know you guys are very busy people, and I really, really appreciate you coming in here today um, and, and meeting with me. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is, a, this is a lot of fun. I think this is a good discussion. Hopefully people at home found it to be uh, informative, uh, and I look forward to continuing serving this, this community for the next two years, and again, I, I tell everyone every time, reach out to me if there's any questions or if there's ever anything you need. Uh, I'll give 517-373-0478. They can call me or email me at robertwittenberg at house.mi.gov and always happy to help. But appreciate oh, you having thank me you. here. Yeah, and the same thing. I'm really, I feel very welcomed in to Oak Park and this community here. I'm so excited for the opportunity to represent uh, Oak Park in the state Senate. And I will say this for the Oak Park residents that are watching. I don't think there is a single state senator and state representative who work closer together than Robert and I. Uh, and that's to the benefit of the people that we mutually represent. So rest assured, your state government, your state officials are functioning. Uh, <laughs> they're partnering together. Uh, and we are all uh, in the same direction trying to move our local communities forward. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. I want to, again, thank my guests, 
State Senator Jeremy Moss and State Representative Robert Wittenberg for joining me on this month's show. I look forward to seeing you again next time.